In this lecture, we are going to cover pharmacology of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, known as NSAIDs, as well as pharmacology of prostaglandin analogs. But before we do that, let's first discuss what happens during inflammatory response. So, following tissue injury or irritation, enzyme called phospholipase A2 is released, which converts phospholipids in the cell membrane into arachidonic acid. Now, arachidonic acid is the substrate for two major enzymes, the cyclooxygenase, abbreviated as COX, and 5-lipooxygenase, abbreviated as 5-LOX. In this lecture, we're going to focus just on the cyclooxygenase pathway. Now, the COX enzyme exists in different forms, two of which are COX-1 and COX-2. The first one, COX-1 isoform, is expressed constantly throughout the body, and it's primarily responsible for production of thromboxane and prostaglandins, which stimulate normal body functions, such as secretion of protective gastric mucus, regulation of gastric acid, promotion of platelet aggregation, and maintenance of renal blood flow. Now, on the other hand, COX-2 isoform is not expressed constantly in most tissues, but instead it is induced at sites of inflammation. So unlike COX-1, COX-2-derived prostaglandins mediate mainly inflammation, pain, and fever. Now that we discussed the role of COX enzymes in the uh, inflammatory response, let's talk about mechanism of action of NSAIDs. So NSAIDs act primarily by inhibiting COX enzymes, which simply leads to decreased production of prostaglandins. As a result, NSAIDs produce anti-inflammatory, antipyretic, and analgesic effects. Now, based on their selectivity for COX enzymes, NSAIDs can be divided into three broad categories. First, selective COX-1 inhibitors, which include ketorolac, fluorbuprofen, ketoprofen, indomethacin, and low-dose aspirin. In the second category, we have relatively non-selective COX inhibitors, which include naproxen, ibuprofen, pyroxicam, and diflunosol. And finally, in the third category, we have selective COX-2 inhibitors, which include meloxicam, diclofenac, silacoxib, and etodolac. Now, this relative selectivity for the COX enzymes explains some of the differences in efficacy and safety of these NSAIDs. So, the most common adverse effects of NSAIDs occur in the gastrointestinal tract. This is where COX-1-mediated production of prostaglandin E2, PGE2 for short, and prostacyclin, PGI2 for short, plays an important role in the synthesis of protective mucus as well as regulating normal gastric blood flow. This is why inhibition of COX-1 increases risk for GI bleeding and peptic ulcers. Agents that are more selective for COX-1 are associated with the highest risk. Now, the second major side effect of NSAIDs results from inhibition of COX-1-mediated production of thromboxane A2, TXA2 for short. As you may remember, thromboxane A2 promotes platelet aggregation. So decreasing its formation results in antiplatelet effect and thus increased risk of bleeding. This effect is particularly evident with the use of aspirin, which unlike the rest of the NSAIDs, irreversibly inhibits COX-1 enzyme in platelets. Moreover, because platelets don't have nucleus, they can't make new enzyme, so aspirin-induced antiplatelet effect persists even after aspirin therapy is stopped, as it takes several days for the new platelets to replace the old ones. So again, agents with higher selectivity for COX-1 enzyme are also associated with prolonged bleeding time. Now, let's discuss the third major adverse effect of NSAIDs, which results from their actions on the kidney. So renal prostaglandins, specifically E2 and I2 types, cause dilation of the renal efferent arterial, which is important for maintaining glomerular fil filtration rate. That being said, under normal conditions, these prostaglandins have only minimal effect on renal perfusion. However, when kidney function becomes compromised, for example due to heart failure or old age, the production of prostaglandins becomes a significant factor in preservation of the renal blood flow. So, because NSAIDs decrease production of renal prostaglandins, they also may increase the risk of kidney injury in susceptible patients. Now, the last major adverse effect of NSAIDs that I wanted to discuss results from their actions on cardiovascular system. So while agents such as aspirin with high COX-1 selectivity can have protective cardiovascular effect due to the antiplatelet properties, 
Agents with high COX-2 selectivity can have the opposite effect. In order to understand where this adverse effect comes from, let's take a look at the blood vessel supplying blood to the heart. So under normal conditions, we have a balanced effect between prostacyclin and thromboxin A2. Now prostacyclin is produced mainly by COX-2 in the endothelium and it's responsible for vasodilation and inhibition of platelet activation. On the other hand, thromboxane A2 is produced mainly by COX-1 in platelets and it's responsible for vasoconstriction and promotion of platelet aggregation. So now the problem arises when selective inhibition of COX-2 tips the balance in favor of thromboxane A2 formation. This makes vasoconstriction and platelet aggregation more likely to occur. This in turn leads to increased risk of cardiovascular events including myocardial infarction and stroke. Now that we discussed NSAIDs, let's talk a little bit more about prostaglandins. So even though prostaglandins can produce many unwanted effects such as inflammation, they are also responsible for many beneficial effects. In order to harness those beneficial effects, scientists develop prostaglandin analogs which simply mimic our endogenous prostaglandins. Now prostaglandins exert their effects by interacting with specific G-protein coupled prostaglandin receptor of which there are at least nine known subtypes. The effects of particular prostaglandin may vary widely depending on the tissue and express receptors. So now let's discuss some of the commonly used prostaglandin analogs, starting with analogs of prostaglandin E1. Examples of agents that belong to this group are alprostadil, lubiprostone, and misoprostol. Although all these agents are derived from prostaglandin E1, they were designed for different therapeutic purposes. So alprostadil has two main therapeutic uses. First is rectal dysfunction. When alprostadil is applied into the urethra, it acts via direct stimulation of CAMP pathway to decrease intracellular calcium levels, allowing for relaxation of trabecular smooth muscle and dilation of cavernosal arteries. This ultimately leads to improved erectile function. Secondly, alprostadil is used in neonates with congenital heart defects to temporarily maintain the patency of ductus arteriosus. So for those of you who need a refresher, ductus arteriosus is a blood vessel found in babies before birth that allows blood to bypass the pathway to the lungs. Although this blood vessel typically closes shortly after birth, keeping it open in certain babies with heart defects may improve blood flow and oxygenation. So infusion of alprostadil relaxes the ductus arteriosus and supports its patency until surgery can be performed. Now let's move on to the next prostaglandin E1 analog, that is lubiprostone. So lubiprostone is used in the treatment of chronic constipation. It works by activating type 2 chloride channels in epithelial cells lining the intestine. By stimulating these channels, lubiprostone promotes secretion of chloride followed by passive secretion of sodium and water, which increase the liquidity of the intestinal contents. This secretion also stimulates intestinal smooth muscle contractions, which facilitate the passage of stool. Now let's move on to the next prostaglandin E1 analog, that is misoprostol. So misoprostol is another prostaglandin E1 analog, and it is used to treat and prevent stomach ulcers, particularly in patients taking NSAIDs. It can also be used to induce labor. Misoprostol works by binding to the prostaglandin receptor on the gastric parietal cell and causing decrease in intracellular CAMP, leading to decreased activity of proton pump and thus modest inhibition of acid secretion. Furthermore, misoprostol protects the stomach lining by increasing bicarbonate and mucus production. Lastly, by interacting with prostaglandin receptors in the uterus, misoprostol causes softening of cervix and uterine con contractions leading to the expulsion of the uterine contents. Now let's move on to prostaglandin F2-alpha analogs. Examples of agents that belong to this group are bimatoprost, latanoprost and travoprost. These agents are used ophthalmically for treatment of open angle glaucoma. They work by increasing the outflow of aqueous fluid from the eye and thus lowering intraocular pressure. 
Although latanoprost and travoprost accomplish that by interacting with prostaglandin F receptors located throughout the eye, bimatoprost is thought to have a different mechanism of action, which is currently unknown. Furthermore, among the unique side effects of bimatoprost is elongation and darkening of the eyelashes, which makes bimatoprost useful in treatment of eyelash hypotrichosis. Now let's move on to the last group of analogs, that is prostacycline analogs. Examples of agents that belong to this group are iloprost and treprostanol. These agents are used to treat pulmonary arterial hypertension. They work by increasing production of CAMP, which leads to decreased levels of intracellular calcium in pulmonary vascular smooth muscle cells, ultimately causing vasodilation. This results in significant reduction in pulmonary vascular resistance and enhanced cardiac index. And with that, I wanted to thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and as always, stay tuned for more.